on the one hand we have the brain, 13 or 1400 grams of gray and white matter uh, consisting of 10 to the 11 brain cells, a biological tissue like the liver and the heart, it's an organ in the body. On the other hand, we have what everybody is at some level intimately familiar with, which is the mind, which is your thoughts and your experiences and your perception. So the puzzle is how those two are related to one another. And the more you start to think about it, the more of a puzzle it seems. If you open a physics book, it doesn't say anything about dreams. It doesn't say anything about pain and pleasure. If you open a molecular biology book, if you open a chemistry book, it doesn't say anything. Yet clearly, these pains and pleasures emerge out of a physical system. So how do they emerge? What is the relationship between these very complicated molecular circuits and my conscious experience? That's a big mystery. Around 1800 or so, like a little earlier, you had phrenology on the rise. That different parts of the brain were specialized for certain kinds of things. So you thought of the brain as, you know, there were little organs here uh, that were responsible for love and for hate and for being conscientious and diligent. And you could just feel people's uh, bumps on their skull and tell something about their personality from this. Well, of course, that, that was completely wrong. But some of the basic idea that parts of the brain are specialized for certain cognitive functions was actually right. What maps onto particular parts of the brain are more simple and in many ways more abstract kinds of things. Language, memory, and decisions. The trolley problem. Runaway trolley. Four men in its path. All of them will die. But wait, you can pull a lever. You can change the trolley's course to another track where only one man stands. You have a choice. Kill one or let four die. What are you going to do? Um, I will pull it. I'd pull the lever and divert the train. Yes, I would absolutely pull the switch. Most people say, yes, that's a morally right thing to do because what you're doing is essentially the utilitarian thing. That means having one person die isn't as bad as having four people die. Absolutely. You're saving four lives. There's another equivalent scenario. Same situation. Runaway trolley. Four men will die. But this time you're on a bridge. And there's a man there. He's fat. Fat enough to stop the trolley and save the four men. But he won't jump. He'll need to be pushed. Can you push the man over the edge? I don't think that would be a possibility at all. And I don't think this would be justified. I can't do that. Most people say, no, that's not an appropriate thing to do. This is a real mystery because the outcomes are the same. If all you really care about is what is the consequences of your action, you should feel morally at ease with pushing the person off the bridge if you felt at ease with flipping the switch before. Every moment of our life, our brain is making hundreds of decisions for us. We have to compute all the things in our environment that have value and then make decisions about essentially all our preferences. We need to understand what the biological basis of that is. We need to understand how it is that neurons in our brain are producing those kinds of decisions. Economics begins with the understanding that our desire is essentially infinite and the resources are finite. And so we have to make a decision. 
Neuroeconomics is basically trying to combine the, the powerful mathematics of economics with the careful observation and nuance about human nature and, say, psychology. We're interested in how emotion influences economic decisions and how we can measure that and understand it. Imagine how great it would be to be able to go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and simultaneously measure brain activity with lots of traders at the same time and measure, in a sense, the heart and the mind of the market, almost literally. We can't go to the floor of the exchange and put every trader in a six-ton fMRI magnet. But you could take one subject at a time and scan their brains. Position this, right about like that. Yeah, I'm going to get you to relax back with your head right here. Yeah. fMRI is essentially an enormous magnet that you're inside. It operates simply by measuring differences in blood flow in your brain. So where the blood flows, the, the thoughts go, uh, they're tightly linked. One of the major tools is just to do an experiment. So we use something called the ultimatum game. The ultimatum game. Two people, total strangers, A and B. A is given $10 and has to share some with person B. So A has to make B an offer. B gets to decide if she is going to accept or reject. If B accepts, they both get to keep their share. But if B rejects, nobody gets to keep the money, and they both lose. In the ultimatum game, if you're a little too greedy and you don't offer quite enough, nobody gets anything. So it's a kind of revenge that costs you a little bit of money to punish somebody you think has been greedy or unfair or violated a social norm of sharing. Neuroscientists have actually put people in an fMRI to play the ultimatum game. And what happens is it makes kind of a nice simple story about what the brain is doing when people face an unfair offer. That there's activity in a brain area called the insula. That's an area that's involved in expressing bodily discomfort like hunger, disgusting smells, uh, pain. All those areas activate the insula. So when people say that offer is disgustingly low, the same brain area is active as is active when you smell a disgusting odor. The Ellsberg Paradox. One of the things we're interested in neuroeconomics is risk. So one of the tools we use to study is something called the Ellsberg Paradox, which is a, a, an experiment devised by Daniel Ellsberg in the 60s. And Ellsberg was interested in uh, people's willingness to gamble in the face of known or unknown odds. Two fists. Each contains red and blue marbles. You must gamble on what color marble you will draw. The catch is, in the right fist, you know there are five red marbles and five blue marbles. In the left fist, you don't know the combination of the marbles. Which fist will you gamble on? Five reds, five blues. I want to play with that hand. That one. It looks like this fist is the best bet, but in reality, this fist should be every bit as good of a bet as this fist. People show what's called ambiguity aversion, which is that just averse to the lack of information. If there's something that's ambiguous, something where you would need to acquire more information before you can even make a decision, there's parts in your brain that will inhibit your behavior. When we studied this in fMRI, we found a lot of activity in the amygdala, which is a fear, emotional memory, learning area of the brain. The brain doesn't like being forced to act in ambiguous situations. So when confronted with them and asked about choices, the amygdala transmits a kind of vigilance or caution signal to the orbital frontal cortex, which causes people to say, I'd rather not bet. Economists have been fascinated by this because it looks irrational. You should have some kind of expectation, but we didn't evolve to pick out balls. We evolved not to get killed. And if there's a dark region there, a cave or a dark forest, with something that's potentially lethal, but we have no idea what could potentially be there. You better have a mechanism in place that just says, don't even go there. So the, the, this kind of finding is at the heart of what neuroeconomics is about. In financial markets that may affect things like deciding not to buy stocks that you've never heard of, 
in voting for politicians, you know, a familiar name might make people feel more comfortable. In trying new products, people might avoid a brand new product, reflecting a kind of fear or sort of paralysis in the face of the economic unknown. One of the areas that has really yet to become informed by brain science is moral decision making. Moral decision making is hard. It involves making choices where oftentimes both alternatives aren't very good. And so we have to pick the best of the worst scenario to do. A lot of previous experiments in moral decision making involved as if experiments. Experimenters put people in this hypothetical situation, but we think that those kind of experiments are kind of unreal because people don't make an actual decision. We really hope to be able to see how people, when there's real stakes at risk, uh, how they actually behave, how they actually go about having to make a, a real decision that has real moral consequences. We kind of thought, you know, what's the what's the worst thing we could make people do? What's like the hardest moral decision? And we kind of came up with, you know, taking food from a from a child, right? <laughs> um, and then we thought, you know, okay, well, what's worse than that? Taking food from a child from an orphanage. We decided to uh, set up an experiment that involved uh, real orphans in an uh, orphanage in Africa. It really allows us, by having real stakes, to see how people make real moral decisions. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about the study. It, this is a study on moral decision making. In particular, you're going to be making donations to a charity in Africa. This is a brochure that contains a description of the charity as well as all the children. These are real children with, from a real organization, so it's important to remember that um, your choices will have an impact. In our experiment, we have two scenarios. So in one case, we give people a choice between donating to one child a certain number of meals, or two kids with a certain number of meals each for those two kids. If you choose to give to the one kid, then the two kids get no meals. If you give to the two kids, then the one kid gets no meals. We also have um, what we call the take scenario, where we take away meals from kids. At the beginning of the experiment, we endowed each of the kids with a certain amount of meals, and subjects will be making decisions about taking away from those meals. So they have to make a decision, do I take 10 meals away from this kid or do I take six and six meals away from those two kids? And that makes the decision even harder because now they will be harming kids because they're taking away meals. Some people find this, these choices very difficult and very, very emotionally conflicting. There's no way to give without taking away some of the meals. Right. We ask you to make both decisions to give meals and take away meals. It seems pretty arbitrary, a way to decide how much food to give each mm -hmm. child. Right, so you are asked quite morally hard choices to make, but uh, these are choices you know, we ask you to make. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we ask you to put all your personal belongings in here and remove uh, all the metal from your body. We never had anybody walk out on us and leave the experiment, but people got really involved and I had people afterwards told me, wow, this is like one of the hardest decisions that I ever had to do. Okay, there's his brain. All right, I'm going to start the actual experiment now. I did begin to develop a sense of what I'm doing is going to make an impact positive here and negative here. It was hard. It was really hard. I felt really guilty sitting there watching this little screen with that little symbol, that little ball, you almost feel like you're dropping a bomb from a mile above somebody. From an economic perspective, it's a decision that's made every day millions of times, but it's not one that I personally make very often. Yeah, she's one of the more fairness-minded or equity-minded people that we've seen. 
I was definitely trying to be as fair as possible because, well, first of all, it, it you know, to have to make that the choice to begin with isn't fair. Yeah, she chose to take more meals from two kids rather than taking fewer meals from one kid. People seem to find the gift scenario more rewarding than the take scenario, not surprisingly. And when they find out that they're giving meals to the, to the children, uh, their reward areas like the oral frontal cortex is activated. Whereas in the take scenario, they find that quite unpleasant. So here we see insula activity. This subject seemed to be switching a lot between the two different options, showing that he has a lot of internal conflict, as opposed to other subjects who kind of like follow a set of rules that they came up with. My rule was to save as many kids as you can, but occasionally the pictures of the kids did impact me emotionally. Even as I was making the decision, I was thinking, I'm violating my own rule here because she looked so cute and she was so young and the other kids maybe looked a little older. I think uh, moral and economic decision making are related. It clearly shares some of the mechanisms. We can assign values even to those moral decisions. And then once we assign values, we have numbers, and then the brain can just treat them in the same way as an economic decision. When it comes down to it, when we're making a moral decision, ultimately what we're doing is making some kind of value-based decision. And so the way of thinking about those values in a quantitative way will likely lead us back to economics. In order to split things relatively evenly, I was willing to give up about 15 to 20 percent of the total, but not more than that. I was just so busy trying to figure out how can I keep from taking from any child, and there's no way to do that. I think he settled down on disregarding the number of children he helps. So in this case, he's probably going to switch the lever and... Well, maybe not. He's not. Your predictions are off. My <laughs> predictions are really off for this. Maybe he's one of the types who really doesn't want to make the choice. So he just lets the computer, in some sense, make the choice for him. I did. At the end, I let the computer go. Just let it go because it was too much of a choice, you know. You look at this face, wow, he could eat, he should eat, you know. But you look at these two, well, maybe they need a little... A little malnourished, can use a little more, you know. I wouldn't want to ever have to make that decision. Okay, you're done with the experiment. We're going to come in and take you out. In our economic life, we're deeply concerned with how do we make decisions about things that have different values to us. In our moral life, we think about uh, what are our moral values. Now that we understand that the brain is essentially a value machine, that it's using calculations about value all the way up from very basic processes to moral processes, it really suggests now a new, in a way, kind of unifying principle for understanding how the brain operates. 